you know, um, the first talk is titled, How Disinformation Can Affect Enterprise Decision Making. And the speak, the, it is um, honored to introduce um, Mr. David Branscombe from Microsoft, who is here. Appreciate for being here. And he's a cloud security architect and 14-year Microsoft veteran, helping Microsoft partners learn and deploy the latest security technologies in Microsoft 365, Windows, and Azure. He's a security he has a security certification junk junkie and holds the CISP, CCSP, GISP, GCED, GCWN, GCIH, GMOB, GCDA, GSEC, GSOC, and several dozen Microsoft certifications. And I know you got another one, right, recently? And David has married for 31 years and lives with his wife, da wife and daughter outside of Raleigh, North Carolina. Mr. David, thank you so much. Please, it's your uh, time to come here. Don't clap but yet, I haven't said anything. All right, so we're gonna talk about how disinformation can affect enterprise decision making. So as uh, Prakash mentioned, my name's Dave Branscombe. Um, the one thing that I didn't have in, in my bio is that I made a very bad decision during the pandemic and I bought two puppies. Um, so every day I'm walking two 100 pound golden retrievers around and uh, I think I've pulled my elbow out uh, several times because they're quite strong. But anyway, um, I'm happy to connect with anybody that has questions about security certifications and, uh, and, and talk to you about those. Uh, I, I really do enjoy them and um, uh, I, I find them very valuable in my day-to-day -day work. So let's talk about what this information is and, and what I don't want this to be is a discussion about politics, right? Um, we hear the words disinformation, we hear the words fake news all the time. That's not what I'm discussing here. I'm talking about disinformation as it impacts us as humans, as it impacts businesses. So um, Mark Twain is attributed with this, uh, with this statement, a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is still lacing up its boots. The thing is, he never said that. So it's kind of ironic that this statement about truth and lies is in itself a lie, <laughs> right? Um, but it is, uh, it, it, it does illustrate the, the concept uh, that we're facing right now where information um, is so quickly disseminated around the world and there's very little fact checking being done, right? Uh, very little um, uh, checking of, of, of the truth. Um, with, uh, with content online. So we've seen how disinformation, the, the deliberate use of, of completely false lies um, to either incite people to, to uh, you know, certain feelings, inflame their emotions, um, it can travel under the radar and, and it can actually lead to real economic harm. Um, it can lead to physical damage, it can lead to loss of life. So it isn't just governments that have to worry about the impact of disinformation in, the, in their world, it is also businesses. Businesses can be affected by disinformation. So as a, as a, a quick uh, test, how many of you recognize this logo? Anybody recognize that logo? So in the 1970s, there was a rumor that was floating around uh, that this symbol reflected a link between a global healthcare giant and satanic cults. So for years, Procter & Gamble, that's their logo, they fought these allegations. One of the, the allegations was even that the, um, the CEO of Procter & Gamble had gone on um, a, a well-known uh, talk show during the day and admitted satanic connections to their company. So it all centered, and, and of course that was false, but it centered around the idea that you could connect the stars in the logo into the number 666, right? So it's maybe a little bit of a stretch, right? So again, the problem is none of this was true. Procter & Gamble eventually removed their logo, <clears throat> which had its own consequences. You can imagine what the consequences were. People said, aha. So we were right, it was a satanic symbol and you removed it for profit, right? But then about a decade later, um, in 1995, the rumors started up again. People started uh, bringing up this, this same uh, rumor and it began causing more damage to their reputation. And this time, 
where it came from was there were four distributors for a company called Amway. How many of you have heard of Amway? All right, so there were four distributors of Amway. They make very similar products to what uh, some of the, the, the products that are made by Procter & Gamble. And what these four distributors did was they used a voicemail automation system to send information to their customers, again, accusing Procter & Gamble of these links to a satanic cult. So eventually, Procter & Gamble sued these distributors. They won a $19.5 million uh, lawsuit against them in civil, in civil court. Um, and, and it took a long time for this to actually reach its conclusion. So it wasn't until 2007, so from 1995 to 2007, that, um, that, that the award was actually granted to Procter & Gamble. And, and seemingly put the, uh, the, these rumors to, to rest. And so now, if you look at Procter & Gamble's website, um, this is the logo that you will see. So they brought back the moon just in a little bit uh, uh, fancier uh, color scheme and uh, on the other side of the, the, the logo and so forth. But, but, but we see the, the, the problem here, that a completely fabricated story can have serious implications for a business, can cost them millions of dollars, lots of time, and there's nothing behind it, right? Now, something we have to think about here is there are different kinds of falsified information. There is what we call misinformation, there's malinformation, and there's disinformation. So misinformation, what you see here on uh, the, the left-hand side, is unintentional mistakes. So I said something that wasn't true, but I didn't mean it um, to, to harm anybody. Maybe I, I put the wrong caption on a picture, um, I misquoted somebody slightly. Uh, there was no intentional um, uh, intention to harm behind it. That's misinformation. On the right-hand side, you've got malinformation. And malinformation is deliberate lies about somebody. So. This can be, or, or, or deliberate uh, use of information to harm somebody. So you might think of things like, uh, you, you may have heard of revenge pornography, where someone has had a relationship with someone, they took their little pictures, and then when they break up, they post those pictures as a way of getting revenge on the person. Where those two meet, where the intent to harm and the false information meet, is the little piece in the middle, disinformation. And that's what we're talking about here. That is intentionally created information with the specific desire to cause harm to a country, to a person, to a business. And that's what we're gonna be talking about here. <clears throat> so the general motive in spreading this disinformation is to damage the reputation of some entity, some person, some organization, whatever it is. And, and really it is one of the greatest open threats to democracy that we see right now. So what is disinformation? What's the, the, the root behind it? Essentially, it's hacking your brain, right? So in the same way that cyber attacks, cyber attacks against a network, against a computer system, they attack the CIA triad, right? Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. That's what uh, a cyber attack is, is, is targeted at. The difference between a disinformation campaign and a cyber attack is that the target in a disinformation attack is your cognitive abilities. It's meant to change the way you think about something, change the way you view something. And that's what makes it uh, very unique. It, it's compromising your logic, your analytical abilities, and your critical thinking. So again, you can kind of think of this as uh, cognitive hacking. It's attempting to change the target audience's thoughts and actions using disinformation to change the way that they perceive reality. And it can be done in different ways. Um, so manipulating information, taking things out of context and, and, and creating a different story around that information, or simply misappropriating information. So it can be things like, um, uh, election outcomes, it can be disrupting democratic principles, it can be used to enable financial fraud, um, it can be used to threaten life and property. And so we're going to talk about what that means from a business perspective. <clears throat> 
The tools of the trade are, are, are pretty well known. And uh, as Dr. Ascalon uh, mentioned, one of them is artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is being used to attack um, uh, our, our, own, uh, our, our own brains, you might say. So commercial online platforms. Here we're talking about companies like TikTok, um, uh, Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter, 4chan. These are our platforms that these types of um, uh, actors use to spread their disinformation. Right? The, the, the platforms themselves are not bad, but they are used because they can reach a lot of people very quickly. Machine learning and graphics advancements. Um, probably many of you have seen the videos where um, someone will take somebody's face and turn it into Tom Cruise. That's a, that's a, that's a, a very common one, right? So the ability for um, you know, excellent uh, graphics processing to take place and, and manipulate videos so that it appears that somebody is saying something when they're really not or that, um, uh, doing something that they're really not is one of the tools that they use. And then artificial intelligence is being used to figure out who to target with this, inf with this disinformation. So there's a lot of information about all of us out there on the internet, right? And so people that are targeting our brains can bring that information together and figure out what are you susceptible to? What is it that, that, that's going to, 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 get you, to get you triggered, right? What's gonna trigger you? And, and use that artificial intelligence to, uh, to cause that to happen. So what I'd like you to do here is try to figure out who the real crisis relief coordinator is in this picture. And the answer is they're all fake. So LinkedIn has seen a huge, huge increase in the number of false profiles that are being posted on LinkedIn specifically related to very high profile organizations like Chevron, Exxon, Microsoft, Apple, Facebook. These are companies that, that are being targeted where fake profiles will be uploaded. Maybe they're, they're, they're claiming to be an HR recruiter. Maybe they're claiming to be someone in a position um, uh, like this one is a, a crisis relief coordinator. Now, sometimes what's being done is that these recruiters, people posing as recruiters for, you know, Apple. Let's say so somebody calls you up and says, hey, I'm a, I'm a, or connects you with you on LinkedIn, says, hey, I'm a recruiter for Apple, and I've got a job for you, you're, you're perfect for it. All I need from you is some of this personal information, and we just need to validate your, your social security number and um, a bank account number. And people will fall for it. People are falling for it and it becomes just a, just a regular financial scam just like any other thing. It's also being used uh, very prominently by North Korea in cryptocurrency scams. So what will happen is um, someone from uh, posing to be a representative of a cryptocurrency firm, usually the picture is of, a, of an attractive woman, uh, she will flirtatiously talk with uh, the, the, the target, get them to invest in cryptocurrency, and then vanish, right? So these types of things are happening over and over and over again. Disinformation is absolutely everywhere. So we know it affects governments. How does it affect the enterprise? How does it affect businesses? First thing we want to do is figure out who is behind the lies. And there's three primary groups that have been identified um, or, or, or motivations uh, for this type of disinformation. The, the, the first one is trolls. And trolls are just people that are just trying to, just trying to needle you, just, just trying to get under your skin. They may be organized to a certain degree. We, you know, we'll talk about these a little bit more. But, uh, but generally speaking, they're just, uh, they're just trying to cause unrest. The second one are the profiteers, and there's actually two groups of profiteers, so, so we'll talk about each of those two different groups, but they hope to capitalize somehow on the disinformation um, dissemination. And then the last one is foreign flags, so these are nation states that are trying to um, damage a brand uh, of a business and then perhaps redirect that business over to their own country. So the trolls. <clears throat> the trolls 
are, generally speaking, single individuals or lightly organized groups of individuals. And um, 4chan is one of their, their prominent platforms that they use. They also use Facebook and, and, and all these others, but, uh, but, but 4chan is one that they, that they tend to use. Now, they may have certain ideological reasons for what they do, but in many cases, it really is just to stir unrest, just to get people angry about things, whatever it is. Um, they may just be trying to entertain themselves. Starbucks is a favorite target of these types of internet trolls because they are a liberal uh, uh, business and they have liberal views. And so um, people that want to cause some sort of social unrest will, will generally try to um, uh, make Starbucks look bad. So one of the examples is, is shown here on the slide. This was what was uh, referred to as Dreamers Day. So what happened was um, groups of, of, of trolls on Facebook said, hey, why don't we do this? Let's say that Starbucks is offering all undocumented aliens 40% off on anything they buy at Starbucks today. And then when all these people flood to Starbucks, we'll call immigration. Okay? So that, that impacts Starbucks in two ways, right? First, it's a lie about them. It impacts the, the, their business. But it also kind of challenges their liberal thinking, right? Are they actually going to give the discount to, to, to these dreamers, right? Um, they weren't very successful in this particular effort, uh, but there was an effort uh, later on against Starbucks again, where they, um, uh, a, 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 a person posted on Facebook purporting to be a, um, an African-American employee of Starbucks and uh, based in Atlanta, and according to the Facebook uh, post, she said that she had spit into the coffee of a white woman, that she had ground up dog feces and put it into a hot cocoa for a child, and that she had put her own blood in the jam that was being used on someone's bagel, and then put that out there. All completely false. There was no such employee. Nothing of the sort was done, but you can imagine the impact that it had on the Starbucks stores in Atlanta. Many of them actually had to close down for the day because they were being overrun by angry people uh, trying, to, trying to figure out what's going on here. So what was the motivation? Just to cause social unrest, just to get people angry. There wasn't any, any overriding objective here. It was just to get people upset. So we see this type of thing over and over and over again, but these are the trolls. Moving on to a different group, we have what we call the profiteers. And the profiteers, as I mentioned, fall into two different groups. The profiteers can be, uh, for example, individuals or slight, lightly organized groups who profit in some way from the infrastructure of disinformation. So, uh, one of the examples here is this uh, prank website, and there's dozens of these prank websites that you can find. One of them is this channel23news.com. That's a screenshot of what it looks like, and that's how easy it is to, to set this up. You go there, you put in a, a headline for your news article, you type in the information for your news article, put a picture on it, boom, post it up there, and it looks like a poorly um, structured uh, news article. Right? It, it, it's not going to fool anybody for very long, but what they do is these, uh, the, the, the people that host these websites, they are counting on you not reading the entire thing where it says, ha ha, this is a prank, you've been pranked, but that you'll just forward it to all your friends on Facebook. They'll get clicks, they get money. Right? So some of the guys that have done this, um, make, made a, a, a pretty decent living. There's, there's a gentleman from Portland, Maine, who um, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, or may, maybe a little bit earlier than that, uh, lost his job. So he, he had been working in like, like the lumber industry or something. And he decided to start uh, creating prank stories. Um, and, and, and his goal, so he, he was a liberal, he was trying to 
um, prank uh, conservatives. And so he would come up with these ridiculous stories about, you know, Bill and, and, and Hillary have a, a slave ship uh, anchored off the, 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 the coast of New England, and, and they, they, they send their friends out there, and they have sex parties and all this kind of stuff, right? So, so, so they, they just created these completely outlandish stories, but because nobody actually checks them, they would get promoted and promoted and promoted and promoted. And he actually was able to support himself and his family for three years just creating these nonsense stories, okay? There is um, uh, the example that, that I have here, the, the, the third bullet point is of a, uh, an Indian restaurant in uh, London named Kari Twist. And what happened to them uh, was, was very unfortunate. What happened was somebody had created a story on this channel, 23news.com, that said that Kari Twist was using human flesh in their meals, okay? And so people became very, very angry, as you can imagine. And there were bomb threats against the store. There were threats against the, these people's lives. They had no idea what was going on until they finally asked somebody, where are you hearing this? And they said, it's posted all over Facebook. And then they went on and saw, okay, somebody's making up lies about us. Now you might think, okay, well, it's just a joke, except that Kari Twist is now permanently closed. So the work that this family put into creating a business, maybe this was what they were using to um, support family in India, maybe it was uh, their retirement fund, whatever it was, all that's gone because somebody decided it would be clever to, to play this trick on them. So the consequences of this type of, of behavior are very real. That's the first type of profiteer, the people that create the infrastructure for disinformation. The second type of profiteers are the ones who actually create disinformation. So we refer to them as black PR firms. So not, not black as in African American, but black as in you know, bad. Um, so, so bad public relation firms, um, people that are creating public relations that you don't want to be associated with. So, you can think of them as disinformation for hire. Generally speaking, the majority of these are Russians. Uh, the Russians are very, very good at creating disinformation, and many of them are um, profiting off, uh, off the creation of this disinformation. So um, there's a company uh, called Recorded Future. They have a, a, a threat intelligence group called the Insect Group, and they uh, decided that they wanted to figure out how good these um, uh, uh, disinformation profiteers were at their job. And so what they did was they created two fictitious companies and contacted uh, the Russian actors and pit those two companies against each other. So, so they, they, they wanted to see what could be done. And what actually happened was, was pretty fascinating. So for about 4,000 um, bucks, each company would get this massive disinformation campaign against the other one, including things like filing false um, charges against people in the organization that law enforcement had to uh, address. So they would try to um, you know, say that uh, some, some, someone w w was a pedophile or that someone had uh, you know, run over somebody and killed them or whatever. None of it true because obviously those people did not exist, but they would create this information and then target it at the other organization. So again, these false accusations are part and parcel of, of how these people make money. Now, another thing that, that I should mention here is that these are not mutually exclusive, right? So, so trolls can work with profiteers, profiteers can you know, have trolls as part of them. It, 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 they're all just this, uh, uh, awful uh, organization of, of misinformation, but they're not uh, mutually exclusive. The last group is foreign flags, and as I mentioned, foreign flags generally fall into the category of uh, nation states who are trying to redirect business from one company in, in, in one country over to the company in your country. So, 
There are about 70 nation states that support uh, these types of disinformation organizations. One could reasonably assume that the United States is one of them. Um, the idea, again, is to inflict damage on companies and redirect uh, business to uh, the, the, the company in your own country. Tesla is a favorite target of the Russian disinformation uh, campaigns. So Russia's news organization is called RT, Russian Times, and that is almost entirely funded by the government and, and, and the, the, the stories are approved and, and sanctioned by the government. It, it, it is a, a, a government news organization. And so it's kind of interesting here, there was a study done about the tone of news articles that were done about Tesla in different oil producing regions. So on the, let's see, your left, um, we have the, uh, uh, the, 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 the news organization is Al Jazeera, you can see up at the top. Al Jazeera, of course, represents the Middle Eastern oil producing countries. On the far right, you have uh, Telesur, uh, which represents uh, like uh, Venezuela and, and so, so some of the uh, oil producing countries down in the, in the Caribbean and uh, South America. And, and you see the, uh, the different color bars. So green represents a positive news story about Tesla. Red represents a negative story. Blue represents a, a neutral story about Tesla. Now in the middle, you see the Russian news agency. And by a margin of about eight to one, Russian news agencies are very negative toward Tesla, okay? Now you might think logically that the reason behind this is Tesla is an electric vehicle organization. Russia uh, depends heavily on their oil producing uh, 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 revenue, but so do these others. So do, so, so do the Middle East and so does Venezuela. So why is there so much animosity, you might say, uh, toward Tesla by, by Russia? And what's been um, theorized by, by some is that it isn't solely about oil, but it's a way to destabilize the stock market in the United States, to build distrust in United States um, companies. So that's, that's one theory behind it. The way they do this, uh, it's kind of interesting that, that they'll use biased information, they'll also use completely false information, so they'll say things like, um, you know, Tesla cars just blow up randomly. And then uh, another favorite is that they will target Elon Musk's personality, because he's, he's a colorful guy, right? He, he's kind of interesting, says some crazy stuff, does some crazy stuff, and so they'll target that. Now, what becomes super interesting is now that Elon Musk owns Twitter, a social media platform that, uh, that, that, that we've said is being used as a disinformation tool. How's that gonna play out? So, you know, buckle your seatbelts. This is gonna get interesting. So what can we do about it? It's a big problem. One of the things that, uh, that we have to do is improve media literacy. We have to make sure that people understand um, how to read articles and stories with a critical eye. To, to be able to understand what's going on, put it in the context of what else you know in the world, and try to piece those pieces together. Don't just accept things at face value, but, but uh, uh, try to build some context around it. <clears throat> As a business, what are some things that a business can do if they find themselves to be the target of disinformation? So, there's a, there's a four-step process that if you go to Microsoft's Digital Defense Report for 2021, uh, they outline uh, this information. Um, because we recognize disinformation is one of the, the biggest threats to information integrity. But the first thing is figure out who benefits from this information. So the, uh, the Latin phrase there, qui bono, means who, who benefits. Who's the one that, 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 that benefits from, from this false information? What are they saying um, and, and why? Why now? Why us? Right? Try to figure that out. 
It's, a, it's an arduous process. We have to go through the process of, of collecting the information that's being said about our organization and then try to figure out what is the, the goal of the disinformation, try to figure out who is generating it. Now, attribution, as you know, is very difficult in the, in the cyber uh, threat world. Um, it's gonna become even more difficult when you talk about disinformation. But there is infrastructure, right? They, they do use infrastructure to do this. And if you, can, if you can figure out who that infrastructure, who's behind that infrastructure, uh, maybe it becomes a little bit more, more uh, clear. And then uh, figure out what the observed impact is on your business. How, how's my timing, by the way? How much? 10 minutes? Okay. Um, hmm? Okay. This is going to get really fast, really quick now. <laughs> So uh, the second thing is assess the impact. I, I think I'm using the wrong deck, I, I apologize. I think I have a, uh, an older deck that I'm using. Is this uh, does not look right. Hang on one second. <clears throat> I apologize. Da, 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 da. There we go. That's the one. Okay. So the second one is, is assess the impact. <clears throat> now, what do we mean by assessing the impact? One of the things that we have to do, um, there's different groups that are impacted differently by these types of disinformation campaigns. One of them um, might be the, 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 the management and HR department. So if there's a disinformation campaign against an organization, one of the things that's going to be impacted are the employees. They might feel uh, uncertain about uh, the, you know, the trustworthiness of the information that they're receiving from their, their, their company. And so HR needs to get in front of that and, and help people understand what the truth of the matter is and uh, what, um, uh, what may be, be, be behind some of these uh, stories. Another area is the security and data science teams, uh, something that's been mentioned several times as being uh, a highlight of, uh, of uh, the school here. So one of the targets of disinformation campaigns is often the information stores within an organization. And so it may be necessary to run um, these A-B tests, just simple randomized tests um, or assessments against your artificial intelligence or your trained algorithms to make sure that those haven't been corrupted and uh, could, could now be misused by, uh, by the attackers. And then the finance teams have the uh, troublesome task of trying to figure out what is the economic impact of this disinformation? How is this going to impact uh, our, our business going forward? That kind of flows into this idea of quantifying the consequences of, uh, of the disruption. So um, we have to figure out who are the humans that were affected? What are the um, enterprise processes that have been impacted? What is the collateral damage uh, of this disinformation? And how severe is it? Is it something that uh, is, is easily um, refuted and, and you can go about your day? Or does something need to be created, you know, a, a, a counter information campaign to make sure that people understand uh, what, the, what, what the truth of the matter is? And the goal of this is to be able to inform future investments about mitigations and controls. And then the last piece is assessing privacy implications. So if disinformation has impacted your organization, as we mentioned, there is the possibility that your own information has been corrupted, right? If your own information has been accessed or if it has been corrupted, there are potential privacy implications around that because people's information may have been um, accessed and, and may have been changed. So you have to uh, do an analysis, figure out which controls worked, how do we know that they worked, and um, what does this teach you about things like your data resiliency, your hot cold data centers, your hot cold backups, um, and so on. So, you need to figure out what, what the gaps are in your environment and the controls that have to be reported to your leadership um, to be addressed in a timely manner. All right, so the role of education. 
This is where it gets, uh, gets real for the university here, right? This is a kind of an interesting story. So um, the Stanford Civic Online Reasoning Study was done uh, just recently, and it evaluated the ability of a number of Stanford students to see how well they were able to identify fake news or disinformation, and um, the results were not very encouraging. <laughs> So 52% of the students, uh, they were given a picture, a grainy black and white picture of someone ballot stuffing, which was known to have been generated by a Russian disinformation organization. And only three out of 3,000 people in the study, three out of 3,000 students, identified it as false. Three out of 3,000. Two-thirds of the students couldn't tell the difference between a news story and an ad, even when the ad had the words sponsored content imprinted over it. And then lastly, 96% of students had trouble identifying why a link between the fossil fuel industry and a climate change website might affect that website's credibility. Now, if Stanford students, who are widely recognized as being relatively intelligent people, if they can fall victim to these scams in such dramatic numbers, what hope does anybody have? Right? So the logical question is, does this mean that the disinformation efforts are just that good? The model for disinformation education in Finland would answer no. So because of its geography, Finland shares a border with Russia. Because of that geography and because um, uh, of, of just historical background, Finland has been a target of Russian disinformation campaigns for decades. Um, and since the Ukrainian invasion, that disinformation campaign has ramped up even further. So it can be partially attributed to the fact that uh, Finland has rejected the principle of neutrality and has uh, clearly shown that they want to side with NATO, right? Um, so that, that's uh, aggravating Putin. But also because they are supporting the sanctions against Russia right now, uh, both financially and militarily. Um, now because of, of this, this attack by, by Russia, this disinformation attack by Russia against Finland, Finland has instituted an education program from elementary school all the way through seniors. Se seniors, uh, you know, in, in people in their 60s, 70s, right? Not senior in high school. Um, and what they do is try to equip these people with the tools that they need to identify disinformation. So for example, when, when uh, Putin made the announcement that they, they were calling up 300,000 people uh, to serve in the military just a, you know, a few weeks ago, uh, there was a, a, a picture posted on um, a website that supposedly showed this massive line of cars leading up to the Russian or to, to, to the Finnish border. The people in Finland recognized that this was a valid picture from years ago. Okay, it was not a current picture. So again, it was taken out of context. So they immediately said. No, this information is not correct. This is not what's happening. It is a valid picture, but it is not reflective of the current situation. So the, the, the training, as I mentioned, reaches down to elementary school uh, children, and, and they're finding that children actually really enjoy the process of, of tracking down disinformation. They kind of equate it to when you give a child one of those puzzles where it says spot the differences, right? That's what they look at it as. They, they, they say, you know, try to find what's not true in here and, and prove that it's not true. The result is that 71% of Finnish people trust their government. The same study shows that 21% of Americans trust their government. Now, you might make the, uh, uh, the, the, the assumption that, well, this is you know, a Scandinavian country, they have a good social system, they have a lot of money, they, they, they have the ability to create these types of programs, but, but, but it, won't, it won't scale to um, uh, a large country with uh, poor resources. And that's not true. Uh, the, the same type of training system was implemented in Uganda 
during the COVID epidemic um, because people were unsure of whether to trust the vaccines. They had been told that uh, witch doctors had, um, or, 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 or traditional healers, I guess is what they're called, um, had, had these uh, medicines that could be used and, and th that they should use those instead. Um, so the government was trying to instill trust in the, in the vaccines. And so they used this methodology and they found the same sort of results. People trusted uh, this type of information uh, when it's presented in, in the right way. Whoops. So what is Microsoft doing to fight disinformation? Um, if you wonder why I skipped through that, it's because I had moved that slide <laughs> in my later deck. So Microsoft has adopted four different principles to anchor our work in fighting disinformation. So we start with the principle that um, we are committed to respecting the freedom of expression and we uphold our customers' ability and desire to create, publish, search for information um, using our, our platforms, our services, uh, our, our products. Secondly, we will proactively work to prevent our products and platforms from being used to amplify foreign uh, cyber disinformation content. Um, third, we're not going to willfully profit from foreign cyber influence content or actors. And finally, we're going to prioritize surfacing content to counter foreign cyber influence operations by utilizing internal and trusted third party data on our products. So that's the official statement. Um, it's listed in the, the URL that I have uh, uh, down there, uh, Defending Ukraine. It's, a, it, it's a, uh, a document written by legal counsel Brad Smith. Um, but how is this going to happen? Right? Those, those, are, those are ideals, but how, how is it going to be implemented? So the first thing is um, hunting, tracking, and disabling the infrastructure of these disinformation actors. So in the same way that we can track cyber threat actors, people that own botnets, people that are doing DDoS attacks, people that are doing phishing campaigns and so forth, there is an information infrastructure behind disinformation actors. And so we can identify those and take them down where necessary, or at least disrupt their operations. The second thing is choke off their financial supply. So if there's no profit in, in making uh, this type of disinformation or, or, or building up the infrastructure around this disinformation, then hopefully it will become less, uh, um, less prominent. <clears throat> We want to also um, work with uh, government and industries to um, figure out ways to um, uh, uh, maintain information integrity as a principle. So build additional technologies that will help to ensure that uh, information is secure. And then lastly, secure international norms. So try to come up with a, a way that as a, a, a planet, um, the countries can come together and, and figure out what is right and what is wrong when it comes to information and, and this idea of cognitive hacking. So um, take a look at, at the article there. Um, it's, it's explained in much more detail. Um, it is a big job, <clears throat> but uh, universities like uh, University of North Dakota here have uh, the opportunity to participate in that. And I noticed some of the, <clears throat> some of the, the posters back there even touch on some of this information, right? So uh, these are the resources uh, that I took uh, this information from. Um, that's my email address, my blog, and my LinkedIn. You're welcome to contact me, connect with me. Um, I will do my best to uh, you know, respond to you. I hope this has been inform informative for you, and thank you for your attention. Oh, yeah, question, sorry. All makes perfect sense. Perfect. Oh, yes. So, <clears throat> in Finland, the uh, training to detect fake news, I'd, I'd be interested in what some of the techniques or methodologies uh, that are involved with that training to detect the, the fake news. Can you say something about that? 
Um, so, so the articles I read didn't go into a whole lot of uh, detail about the specific methods that were used in Finland. Um, uh, more or less just, just the idea that, uh, that, that they had training around um, ensuring that, that, that people could uh, rationally figure out you know, when, when something is said in a news article that is inflammatory, that uh, is causing conflict maybe within the classroom, how do I identify you know, what the truth is? And um, I, I, I mean, it's an interesting question, but, but I don't know the answer. Yes. One of the most dangerous cyber attacks I've experienced, like me personally? Not personally, yes. Oh. On the, on the organization. Against Microsoft? <laughs> uh, we don't talk about that. <laughs> and that's the truth. Thank you. Thank you so much for spending. Thank you very much.